With the release of Jessica Jones Season 3, it's time to stop and rank all eight main heroes in the Marvel Netflix universe from the worst to the best one last time. Hi, my name is Sean Chandler and I love to talk movies and TV way too much. With that in mind, go ahead and join me down below in the comment section. Share your ranking of the Marvel Netflix heroes. There's no definitive list here, so if you want to throw in some extra characters or cut some people out, that's totally fine too. I just want to have a fun discussion about these characters that I've enjoyed watching over the last few years. Now, my ranking is not based off their power or their strength. It's based off characterization, the performance, the character arcs, not how powerful they are. One one final thing before we get started, right now there's a 35% off sale in my merch store for the next few days. That means my I Talk Movies Too Much shirts, that means my Sean Chandler Talks About shirts, that means some of the other shirts that I wear inside my videos. You can buy one right now for 35% off, that means a $13 t-shirt, but everything in the merch store is 35% off, so if you wanted to get a coffee mug with my beautiful face on it, you can do that for 35% off. This is the biggest sale that they do, these are the lowest prices that I've seen on their site as long as I've worked with them. And with that said, let's get started. Coming in in last place is Iron Fist. He is easily the biggest misfire of the Marvel Netflix universe. A big part of that is that the idea of a rich white guy disappearing for a while and coming back as a superhero has been well played over the last 15 years, whether you're talking about Batman Begins, Iron Man, Arrow, it's been done before. And this is easily the worst version of that. And the simple reason for that is, whereas with Batman, Iron Man, Arrow, these characters went off one way, came back transformed by a crisis event and were a different person on the other side of it, and they became a hero with a mission, Danny Rand doesn't really have that compelling mission and transformation like the other versions of this story arc. Therefore, he's the least interesting, the least inspiring, and the least compelling. Add to that, the writing of season one was clunky at its best, but normally it didn't even aspire to the level of clunky writing. It was that bad. I mean, they made Danny Rand so clueless at times that you just couldn't really respect him as a character at all. Add to that, he's indecisive. He doesn't really want to be the hero at times, and it makes it tough for us to want him to be a hero when he has no qualities that would push us to like him as a hero. And then finally, it feels like our lead actor here was horribly miscast. He just doesn't have the screen presence to command our respect, and when you combine a character that's not written to be very compelling or interesting with an actor that himself can't bring something interesting into the mix, and it just makes for a show that's kind of tough to get through because you just don't really care. With that said, he did get better with every single show that he appeared on, and he was much better in team-ups than he was by himself, and so there were some signs that things were getting a lot better. Unfortunately, he was canceled before he ever actually got to be good. Next up is Misty Knight, a side character who got promoted to robot arm superhero by, well, getting her arm cut off. In theory, the Character progression from detective to superhero should be pretty interesting to me, but the way the character was used and written, she was never particularly compelling to me, and she was actually pretty forgettable. In fact, the previous version of this video, I didn't include her because it just didn't cross my mind to think of her as a superhero, and a lot of people in the comment section kind of called me out on that, appropriately so, but that does call into question just how well, she's been used on this show that I forgot to bring her up. Even though she's been on Luke Cage, The Defenders, Iron Fist Season 2, she just never really made a mark. Contrast that with The Night Nurse, who, while I wouldn't consider her a superhero, makes much more of an impact, and you think of her as a major part of the show that kind of ties the shows together. Misty Knight is just kind of there for me and not particularly compelling. Coming in at number six is Elektra. This is someone that I think at her core is very interesting, and there's a a compelling story there as she can be the anti-hero, the villain, and the hero all at the same time, sometimes in the same episode, but the way they have specifically used her in each of these shows we only see her in her relationships to other people. She's a love interest to Matt. Stick wants to use her. Stick wants to kill her. Stick wants to team up with her. Stick wants her to stop the hand. She is the black sky. And she is the leader of the hand. As cool of a character as she is and should be, 
She never really gets to stand on her own inside of this universe. And in fact, normally the times when she shows up, it's some of the worst aspects of these seasons. Kicking off our top five is Luke Cage. He is easily the most naturally charismatic and likable of the Marvel Netflix heroes, as he's this unassuming, kind of a normal guy that just wants to clean up his neighborhood. Unfortunately, from that basic setup that I really like, I don't think they've taken him on any journeys that I've wanted to go on. When they first introduced him on Jessica Jones season one, I was actually really excited for him to get his own show. And then the first half of his first season of his show, it absolutely won me over as this guy that's not trying to save the city. He's the guy that just happens to be able to save his neighborhood and that's what he wants to do, clean up those streets. But the further we went along through the season and then moving into season two, he just got less interesting and less likable at times as well. Now we did get a little touch of him at the end of Jessica Jones season three where he gave her a bit of a pep talk. But in general, this universe left him in a baffling, bizarre place of the end of Luke Cage season two that didn't feel earned. It didn't feel like the natural progression of where you would take his character. And it kind of ended on a sour note that he went from the guy that's the reluctant hero of his neighborhood to that. I really didn't like it. It kind of soured me on the character a good bit. Coming in at number four is Colleen Wing. As much as I've had my frustrations with Iron Fist, especially season one, the actual character arc for Colleen Wing has been quite interesting. She starts off on the show as a dojo owner and a cage fighter. And as we go through this season, we realize she's actually connected to the hand and we get to see the hand from the perspective of someone that's not evil, that's not part of their big evil schemes. And that was some of the best stuff about season one of Iron Fist. Then in Iron Fist season two, they took her character, gave her a character arc where she figuratively and sort of literally took over the show Iron Fist. As I was kind of compiling this list, her character arc was the one that surprised me at how much I actually enjoyed it. Real quick before I give you my top three, if you're enjoying this ranking, consider clicking that subscribe button for more rankings like this one in the future. Or if you finish this video and want more content immediately, Click on this playlist right up here for all of my best and most up-to-date Marvel Netflix rankings. I got the seasons, the heroes, that's what we're doing right now, the villains, all of that fun stuff. If you enjoy this video, there's something in there that you'll like. Coming in in third place is Frank Castle, The Punisher. Netflix managed to take a character that can very easily gravitate towards a very stereotypical, one-dimensional action hero and crafted this dynamic, compelling character that has many dimensions to him. He can be the angry, myopic person that has channeled all of his rage on killing the bad guys, but then he can also be the broken family man who has lost everything and is grieving and processing all that has happened to him. Likewise, they've used him on the show as an ideological opposite of Matt Murdock. So you have two people that want to take out bad guys, but have a very different view on how you should do that. And while he is a mass murderer, we understand the worldview of where he's coming from. Add to that, he also has gotten some of the absolute best dialogue and conversation in all of these seasons, whether it's conversations with Karen or Matt Murdock, they're all fantastic. The thing holding him back from that number one or number two spot is I don't feel like we spent enough time with him in full Punisher mode. When he first debuted in Daredevil season two, he was just mowing down biker gangs, getting in prison fights where he's brutally killing people. And then as we went into season one of his own show, kind of reverted back to kind of a rehash of his origin story. And then in season two, he's kind of reluctantly helping this girl, but we're not seeing full blown Frank the Punisher mowing down bad guys just to punish them. And so that kind of holds it back for me that we're not fully seeing the, the character for a season of his own show. Now they did tease in the last little scene of season two, him going full Punisher, and then the show got killed. Our runner up is Jessica Jones, easily the darkest of the Marvel Netflix heroes as her story is so saturated in the trauma and pain of her past. On the one hand, we see her as having great potential to do good, but it's contrasted by the devastation caused by what Kilgrave did to her. So we get this incredible exploration of what happens when an incredibly powerful person 
loses control. Now I think season two of her show is a little bit of a step backwards for her is instead of her moving past the trauma of her past, they kind of doubled down on it and like, let's look at a different trauma of her past, let's loop back around on it. So that's a little bit frustrating for me, but fortunately going into season three, they kind of up their game, pushed the character forward as she's back as a private investigator, stopping a serial killer and eventually having to face off against her own sister and truly be an example of and become the hero that we know that she could be as we've seen throughout all these shows and kind of ending at a point in time where she's accepting who she really is. But easily coming in at number one for me was Daredevil. The original is still the best because they created a character who has all the excitement with the external conflicts of battling Kingpin, the hand, Poindexter, but more importantly, they gave him deep, internal conflicts that he's constantly struggling with. Matt Murdock, attorney by day, and Daredevil, superhero by night. His mission versus his relationships, his faith versus his brutality, his desire to stop crime versus his belief in redemption. Throughout the three seasons of Daredevil and the season of The Defenders, we've seen him struggle through each of these themes and fight through them, often literally, and come out the other side a different person. He has grown, he has changed, and they've done all of it through stories, not just telling us he's changed, but showing us actually struggle through these deeply human emotions. So for me, he easily comes in at number one, where she figuratively and sort of literally, real quick before, 